So if I were to ask y'all which part of Ben 10 was the darkest, the UAF era would immediately jump to everyone's mind. And while there's certainly solid points to be made there, I feel like we overlook a lot of what's really going on in Omniverse. It's a pretty wild series, but sometimes they get away with some of the craziest and most brutal stories. I'm surprised they aren't acknowledged as much as you'd think. Like everybody in the universe permanently dying, and Ben creates a new universe filled with clones of everyone who still believe they are their original selves. Essentially making Ben the only survivor of a universal genocide, and for the longest time, no one even believes that it really happened. Or if that's not enough, what if the entire multiverse got wiped out, including Ben, leaving it up to his alternate self to restore the timeline and bring everyone back. Or when it turns out that an 11 year old is forced to be part of a hit squad made of child experiments ran by a corrupted galactic police officer, and the child's memories are then replaced, leading to him living a fake life for the next few years, until it's revealed that his dad, the major motivation for him being a plumber, was fake all along. Or Ben being the creator of his own universe a second time. Like, I swear, if the show proper did didn't do these things and someone else suggested them, everyone would say this is the most edgy fanfic bullshit they've ever heard and there's no way the show would ever do that. But guess what? It did. Now I know what some of y'all are thinking. None of this is actually edgy. And sure, I agree. Even when you phrase it the way that I did, there's folks out there that would defend to the death that this is not edgy. I mean, it's Omniverse. It's the colorful, goofy, toned down version of Ben 10. It can't be edgy, right? And that leads me to ask, what is edgy? If it's not the content itself, is it the tones? So then folks might retaliate, it's not Omniverse that's the edgy one, it's UAF. But like, is it? Sure, its tone is much more mature, but I'd argue that just because it takes its topics seriously and plays them straight, I don't think that makes them edgy. Like, is that what edgy is? Just the tone? Well, I don't agree to that either. Point is, whether you consider the content, the tone, or sometimes both of them together, Ben 10 really isn't edgy. In fact, not just Ben 10, a lot of the things that folks say today are edgy aren't really edgy. Longtime fans know I've had this argument for years, so this is nothing new. But dark and edgy are terms that are used so liberally, they have no real meaning anymore. Similar to a lot of things nowadays. Those adjectives now are used just as a way to show that somebody doesn't like something because it's a cheap shot way to attack it. But that's a whole other topic. Circling back, even though Omniverse does treat its objectively serious storylines with a much lighter tone than its predecessors, it does do a pretty solid job with them. Well, sometimes. In fact, today's episode, the one where Alien X recreates the entire universe, is perhaps the worst way they've ever handled a serious storyline. I just want to preface this breakdown with, yes, I do go pretty hard on it, but only because the show itself set its own standards and then broke them. The Ben 10 franchise loves to have its fun, but it has previously taken itself seriously when it needs to and will continue to do so in the future. So to see an episode like this that's 22 minutes of nonsense for what's essentially one of the most important episodes of the entire franchise, it's pretty frustrating. I'm not saying it has to be dark and edgy. That was the whole point of this is like, that's what folks are probably going to jump to when I say that this shit is too goofy. But there's this middle ground that exists that just doesn't get acknowledged anymore. We don't live in black and white extremes in storytelling. But I talk a lot about this during the breakdown proper, so let's just cut it right here. But I do also want to say that this is the episode that they use as an excuse to explain a lot of Omniverse's changes in universe. I know that Derek JY goes back and forth on whether or not certain changes to Omniverse are because of the Annihilarg reset, but other other writers and the show itself kind of prove that it is the case. So after yet another classic lengthy intro from Kuro, let's get into it. But first, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my previous episodes. But by all means, watch this video first. I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. Also, it's been a while since I've given a proper update on 5YL. I mostly keep all the updates to Patreon exclusive because the comic itself, especially the motion comic, are becoming a bit expensive to produce. So I'm trying to reward those that actually 
contribute to its production with the exclusive knowledge about what's happening behind the scenes. But publicly, I will say that the seventh recalibrated chapter is coming out soon and the other ones not long after. Well, I'm also going to put out a public motion comic preview soon. And we're also working with Makeship again for another exclusive campaign, which all of these you can find updates in more detail for on our Patreon. But I've wasted enough time. Let's break this episode down. Len Uli, another seasoned writer for Ben 10, gave us so long and thanks for all the smoothies on October 27th, 2012. The title, of course, being a reference to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Ben learns of the Annihilar Genesis story of Fimia Ghost, a device created by these extinct ancient race of beings to destroy universes if they don't like how they respond to their pranks. This prompts a horde of factions, such as the Vredals, Argent, and the Incursions, to all fight over who gets to keep the device. But after accidentally setting it off, it's up to Ben's most powerful transformation, Alien X, to save the day. Continuing off of Omniverse's trend to trace backgrounds, this Earth right here has been reused from the UAF era, but traced to the Omniverse art style, of course. This moon right here, though, might be straight out of UAF without an art style transition. I think they just used it as is. And right here is the Contamalia ship, with so many parts of it blacked out. You can't really see all of the detail, but spoilers for a decade-old show. You do get to see the full Contamalia ship in the finale, and I wonder if the ship was designed and then had its detail restricted for this shot, or if they just made this, and by the time they got to the finale and they realized, oh no, we have to show this in broad light, they had to make up what all the extra details looked like. This is a great shot of the missiles coming in. And a very dynamic shot here, too. And I love this transformation. Already such incredible visuals for this episode. This powerful leap from Crash Hopper. Rushes by the camera with intensity. Now, it should be noted, throughout the first three series, Ben 10 has always been airing things out of order. And for the most part, you can get away with watching either production or airing order. I wouldn't say they're interchangeable, but it's kind of unnoticeable until you get to Omniverse. Omniverse started really messing with the timeline when they aired stuff out of order, especially during the feedback arc. But this is one of the things that still slips through. So this is production order. The episodes we're breaking the series down in is the way that they were intended to be viewed and distributed. But the only whole is Crash Hopper right here, who you actually see Ben unlock in a later episode with Dr. Animo. But Ben's using him right here as if he's had him this whole time. Now that could open up the debate of, is production order really the true order? And honestly, yes it is. If you had to choose, at least with Omniverse, please make sure you watch it in production order. It's literally just this. <laughs> Such a powerful impact. You can even see he hit it so hard that Crash Hopper starts falling backwards. And the purple glowing trim around the smoke. Seems like Ben's still getting used to him though as he lands with a bit of instability and he's still suffering from the impact of his head. This right here is the museum that was shown in a handful of episodes of Ultimate Alien. Nice save! Adding to the growing list of every time Ben compliments Rook. And before y'all ask, no, I'm not gonna make a counter out of it. I'm sorry, it's just... The idea of making a counter out of this and that is starting to get a little ridiculous. I, I think I'm all set on counters for the rest of the series. Bigger problem. Seems like an anchor. There they are, flying up to the ship. Nice to know that the proto-truck can also survive space. Depending on the mission, they'd have to swap between one of their cars or the RB3. But the proto truck can drive and fly. Technically, Kevin's car can too, but I guess we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen. How's it going up there, Ben? We're on approach now, Grandpa. Max has been around every episode of Omniverse so far. He got demoted to a reoccurring character during the UAF era, which, as much as I love Max, made sense. They're trying to enforce that Ben's on his own now, but now that Omniverse is focusing on the plumber's operations as a whole, of course, Max is going to be featured more. <laughs> And with each series, the plumbers become more and more ineffective. We don't know anything about that ship. Pretty sure we revisit the same hallway too in the finale. But this one's a lot more run down. There's things grown up on the walls. Actually, when looking up the reference photos, in the final episode, Rook and Ben crash the time cycles straight into the Contamelia ship, creating a hole and land in this hallway. And here they enter through a hole in the ship and they first arrive at this hallway. So I'm wondering if this is the hole that they make in the finale. Oh, I've never made that connection before. I wonder how early they planned the finale. Like if they just took the seeds they planted and made a story out of it, or if they knew from the beginning that this is going to be where it all ends. Because if it's the latter, that is some masterclass planning. 
How did you know there was a suitable atmosphere? Never been a problem before. Actually, Ben 10 has been relatively good at making sure that characters who breathe oxygen need some type of suit, both in classic Alien Force and Ultimate Alien. Generally, in animated shows, they don't care about characters going to space without the proper breathing assistance. And there's probably been a scene or two in Ben 10 where it wasn't a problem, but for the most part, they, they are pretty good at it, so I feel like while it's a funny joke, it doesn't exactly work for Ben 10, because they do care on some level. Interesting. Bubble wrap. I like that Rook's flashlight effects change when it points right at us, the camera. More bubble wrap. It's a subtle precursor to the reveal of the Vredals as they were previously distracted by bubble wrap. That hasn't really been a signature thing to them, so I wouldn't say it's an obvious sign that the Vredals are gonna get involved, but it's a nice callback to one of their previous appearances. When the camera angle changes, it's just the same background for right here, but flipped. But because of the way they're drawn and the way your eyes are able to fill in the blinks of them traveling, you wouldn't be able to tell. You scum! This is that image that was reused for one of the comics. A lot of comic art is based on screenshots and stock art of the characters. The Vredal Brothers? I think the Vredals look great in Omniverse. I think their appearance is an improvement over their UAF counterparts. Sup? Light em up, boys. Now these weapons look like they were designed specifically for them. Usually they draw the Vredals using whatever weapons they have in their stockpile of art assets. Come on, Omnitrix. Give me wrath! Completely skipped past the hologram phase here. Gray matter, man. It's been a long time since Ben's accidentally transformed into gray matter. I don't miss it. Although as much as I love the original Richard Stephen Horvitz's performance for Grey Matter, and it's still ultimately my favorite, I also like Omniverse's Grey Matter too. I have got to get a manual for this new thing. Well, you are the perfect alien to figure out the Omnitrix. In one future, your son learned to get master control using this alien. I'm surprised that still worked since the ship is super old. Do you have any hot ch 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 chocolate? I swear, freezing people is one of the least effective things in the Ben 10 universe. This shot right here too, this is also shown in the finale. This is where all the smoothies are operating and such, right before Ben and Rook interrupt them. You're both the worst villains in the galaxy! No contractions so far. I think this is the episode where they first start making sure Rook doesn't use any contractions. I thought you guys became plumbers! Honestly, if they're going to reset the Vredals back to being villains again, I'm glad they at least acknowledge they tried to make them plumbers. Most of the time when Omniverse wants to make changes, they just completely ignore what happened before and just kind of pretend that this is how they always were the whole time. Time. But at least with the Vredals, they're acknowledging like, yeah, we did try to do the whole turn them good sort of thing, but we're backpedaling on that. And you know what? The Vredals work better as villains anyway, so it's good to see them as villains again, but it's also good to hear that everything that happened before is still somewhat relevant. This is how Omniverse should be changing their characters. Doing it for the better, but respecting what came before. If only they'd always treat things like that. These two vermin destroyed the Plumber Academy's ammunition dump. I had to take my final exam in a temporary trailer on an asteroid. This is our first real look at Rook getting rageful. Even Ben's shocked by it. Although he did say in the pilot, When I first became a plumber, I was assigned to my home planet, Ravana. This is my first time away from home. But like I said in the last breakdown, perhaps it's like he was speaking in reference to the mission he was on, and not that he literally hasn't been off-world before. We was merely scavenging this vessel for weapons. Which is when you blew that hole in the bulkhead. We did not. Uh, do we find out who blew that hole in this episode then? I thought it was Ben and Rook from the future past. My ship! That ain't us neither. Okay, every now and then they get me. Tractor beam! These two abominations are coming with us. The Vredals are now Rook's sworn enemy. I wonder if this was something that they were gonna try to do throughout the series, or if it's just for this episode. Either way, I think it's a funny dynamic. Again, Ben's skipping the hologram phase. Maybe since he's always mistransforming anyways, he doesn't even bother. He just figures, what if I just use my core intuition and that'll affect the aliens? I don't know, I mean, good good on you for trying different things, man. Argit. Now, Argit also looks fantastic in Omniverse, I'm not gonna lie. This looks great. I do like his other look, though. Like, I wouldn't prefer this over the other look if we didn't get the other look first. The other look implied that he's still making his way through the streets and trying to do what he can to survive. This kind of getup makes it seem like he's making it work. But if he came out the gate looking like this, I don't think it would have worked for the character. I think we needed raggedy old Argit to show the new, improved, and polished Argit. Ben Tennyson? But his face shape and honing in on his more rat-like qualities in his behavior and sounds and positioning. I really like that too. Did you cut your hair? Bringing back his somewhat catchphrase, but this time saying it to Ben and not Kevin. Kevin, long time no see. You look different. Did you cut your hair? No. You look different. Did you get a haircut? No. 
Did you cut your hair? I have the Annihilar. The Annihilar? The Annihilar? He keeps doing that musical sting every time they say it. Like you can't say a Nihilarg without that boom in the background. The what a hard? But since Ben can't say it, he gets a very discouraging sound. The Nihilarg is just an old legend, like Alien X. Feeding off of Rook's disbelief in Alien X from last episode. Atheist Rook over here. From the bedtime stories my mom used to tell. I know those stories as well. You're the individual who smashed into the side of the ship. Oh, it was Argent. It would have been cool if it was a time loop thing. Never mind. <laughs> I'm probably not going to keep it a lot in the edit, but there is a lot of dialogue in here that's just kind of jokes that aren't working for me. It's all character-based jokes. Like, if you don't really vibe with the character's gimmick to begin with, then all of their jokes fall flat. And these breakdowns aren't really like a comedy analysis anyways. Usually, if, if there's one thing I have to cut, it's the jokes just to avoid copyright. Unless they make me laugh or if I think they're really clever, but slap on the incursions in a few minutes and this episode is just full of gimmicky characters and low-hanging fruit jokes and just characters saying exactly Exactly what you'd expect them to. I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of people that feel very different things about like Argid and the Vredels and whatnot. I mean, even in the very ink tank, I'm sure if you've seen our other work, you've seen Ash and I go back and forth on Argid's character, but I guess it just goes to show that like relying a bit too heavily on the idea that people will find this character funny just because of who they are without really making sure the jokes are more digestible if you don't like the characters. It, it makes the humor hard to work for everybody. So sometimes a scene will be going on for for a minute or something you're just like man can we be done with this but of course like i said sometimes it really works for people i'm not, I'm not trying to hate on the argent and the vredel lovers out there there was an ancient pan-dimensional civilization the contumelia yeah it's really crazy hearing them talk about this knowing how the finale goes like when i first saw this episode when it aired i didn't think any of this stuff would ever come back i thought this was just a one and done kind of deal their favorite pastime living from parallel universe scaring the locals honestly same if they came to dislike a universe they'd whip out the annihilator it it's full names long if you only have time to say the first part. The full name, of course, being the Annihilar Genesis story of Femia Goss. And yes, I said that all in one take the first time right here. I had to figure out how to say it for the Ben 10 Illustrated video, but ever since I figured out how to say it then, I could just always say it now. And yeah, I'm flexing on y'all there. Can you say Annihilar Genesis story of Femia Goss without hesitating or thinking about it? I don't think so. Get on my level, folks. So where are the Contumelia now? They died off eons ago. So even though they're fifth dimensional beings, that doesn't mean they're immortal or all powerful. Powerful. I, I feel like that's a very important thing to stress in the Ben 10 universe. Similar to the Nalgians, where just because they can perceive the 26 plus dimensions doesn't mean they're more powerful than 26 plus dimensions. So the higher dimensional level you can exist, perceive, and withstand does not equate to your power over said dimensions. My favorite example being we as humans invented the nuke, right? But does that mean we're more powerful than a nuke? Like we can withstand a nuclear blast or shoot out nuclear energy? No. Or even more simpler, we can perceive three dimensions. But does that mean we can warp three dimensions? No. So yeah, the Contamelia are 5D beings, but they're still mortals in a way, and they can just die off. Their deserted ship drifts from cosmos to cosmos, bearing a weapon that can in fact destroy the entire universe. So this ship's just floating around, carrying a universal bomb on it. Pretty interesting legend. Why would parents tell their kids this at night? You really think that's gonna help them sleep? A ghost ship with a doomsday device on board? What kind of dimwit would believe that? I mean, at this point, Ben, you really have no place denying anything. Like, how are you gonna go through everything you've been in your whole life and draw the line at this? Lock onto that scow and board him. It's Emperor Milius. He's back. Milius here has continued to be being voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, but unlike an alien force in Omniverse, his pitch goes up and down when he speaks like a frog croaking, and I love that addition to his vocal performance. Anyone tries to cross you? Fry him. Hear that? How he goes up? He goes, cross you? He really starts going up there in the back of his throat, and then he drops down to a bassy, fry him. Love it. There's no way that, uh, watch him a call, it's real. You do the math. Four? Or are, are we adding or subtracting? Yeah, even Rook's dialogue is mostly relying on his gimmick of not understanding Earth culture. Of course, you have to play into what makes a character a character. You know, that's the whole reason they have recognizable speech patterns and personalities to begin with, but with the cast of characters we have in this episode, where the majority of them, in fact, I'd say every single one of them, aside from Ben, whose core personality are, is relying on a gimmick, it makes so much of the dialogue just feel very empty and by the books. It's just there, there's not enough 
diverse personality to really connect with the characters and not every story needs that in fact not every show needs that spongebob's an extremely successful show and none of the characters are really connectable beyond their core personality and character traits they are walking gimmicks and that's what makes spongebob work but ben 10's a show where you kind of need a little extra layers to the characters and it's a show where it does make efforts to make you connect to the characters and care about them in ways beyond entertainment but with this batch of characters it's practically practically impossible to do so. Every single character in this episode aside from Ben is a walking gimmick, even Rook at this point. He hasn't quite evolved into his own person yet. And we'll deal with this an I mean, come on, Ben, Nylarg is not even that hard to say. You're not leaving my sight. Where are you? Now this is interesting. Four episodes in, we already have multiple transformations for a single alien. Cause 16 year old Spider Monkey has his own unique transformation. In fact, at least with the way the pilot was doing it, it implied that they were trying to bring back the old style of transformations by having a specific sequence they refer to every time this character becomes the alien and referring to it every time for significant moments. Pretty much just a magical transformation if I'm gonna keep it simple. And I thought we were going back to that. In fact, UAF did it too. They always had set transformation sequences for all the aliens, sometimes updating them every now and then. But Omniverse? After the pilot, they do pretty much do a unique one every single time, which has its pros and cons. Kind of sucks because there's nothing that recognizable for them, but it's also neat seeing how are they going to make them do it this time. This one's one of the more boring ones. It's another putting on a suit kind of animation, but I'm just surprised that they're already doing away with the very beautiful looking spider monkey transformation sequence that they showed in the pilot. This would have been the perfect time to reuse that. Stay put. <laughs> Put him down! That frog sound effect is used a lot. Okay, Argent. Uh, man! Go Rook. Always killing it. Now. What would Ben say? Lying down on the job, are we? See, this works for Rook, though. He's still trying to learn from Ben and relate to him and, and get used to his style of being a hero. I don't think he realizes making wisecracks really isn't that important in relation to being a world-famous hero, but because Ben said it is and Rook admires him, now Rook wants to be a part of that, too. I expect y'all are thinking that he fires six shots or only five. That's a Dirty Harry reference. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Do I feel lucky? Well, do you? Punk? Does I feel lucky? Well, does you? Frog. Now see, that's a pretty lengthy scene for a reference too. And I can guarantee you almost nobody understood that it was a reference. So like, does the target audience actually find this funny? Cause this is quite a bold dedication to a reference that I don't think any of them are gonna get. So references like that usually only work where it's funny even if you don't get the reference. But like, what's funny about this? <laughs> That part, I guess. Like a very long extended monologue just to undercut his threat with a bonk to the head. All right, I guess I can see the connective tissue there. Anybody? Well, Argent, you shouldn't have escaped. Ben saved your life and went back to check on you. If you just stayed put, you'd be fine. Looking for something? Yeah, the Annihilarg. You really gotta emphasize that R too. You can't just say Annihilarg, you gotta say Annihilarg. That's what you think, tadpole. Oh, that's a button? Dude, I love those kind of odds. Skips the hologram phase yet again. This episode just does not care about how the Omnitrix works. Energy is G-O-O-D. I'm gonna be hearing that quote for the rest of my life. <laughs> ah! I love all those sounds for him moving around. Because NRG doesn't just move his joints. If you see his body twisting, that's actually the metal warping so that he can turn. Because metal is being treated sort of flesh-like. And they add sounds to complement it, too. You double-dealing salamander! You said you'd buy the Annihilarg from me! I conquer worlds for a living. What'd you expect? Okay, so I guess this is the timeline. Contamelia's ship shows up. Argent notices and recognizes it. Goes on the ship to find the Annihilarg so that he can sell it to Milius. Meanwhile, the Vredals also found the ship just to try to scavenge it for weapons, but all of that interference set off a defensive system in the Contamelia ship which started attacking Earth, causing Ben and Rook to retaliate and also explore the ship. I got it. Where is the... Uh, am I... Annihilarg! 
again. Now they're starting to push it though. Like Ben's not that stupid. Even if he genuinely couldn't pronounce it right, I'm starting to lose the humor in the fact that they keep emphasizing he can't pronounce it. Like that's the joke. That's it. Repeating the same joke over and over doesn't make it funnier unless you change it up. Every time they do the joke, it's just the same joke. Ben tries to say an ILARG. He can't say an ILARG. Everyone calls him out on it. So there's no variety in how they're doing it. They're just throwing it back at you every single time, expecting you to find it funny. So and going back to the characters points, that's how everybody's written. They just keep playing into their tropes and they're just like, don't you get it? This is how these characters act. There's the humor. But with the surplus amount of the same joke over and over again, combined with the fact there's no variety of that joke, everybody just sounds like a broken record. And it's like, it's making this episode sort of a chore to get through. Oh, it's you. The Vredel brothers have left the building. With what might be the most destructive device? Why did Arjun even give them the Annihilar? Sure, his deal with Milius didn't work out, but he could have just tried selling it to somebody else. But he's acting like, oh, well, if I can't sell it to Milius, it's worthless now. Here, you, the Vredels can just have it. Come on, Arjun, you're smarter than that. Catch the Vredel brothers before they set off that debt. Annihilarg! Do you get it yet? Do you get it? Ben can't say Annihilarg. It's... Hilarious. Well, if we're repeating jokes. <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny. I still say it's not a real threat. Ben, if all these different factions are fighting over it, it's definitely a real threat. Like, you gotta be fucking with me at this point. What is going on with everybody in this episode? Argent, keep Emperor Emilius from escaping. Okay, for one, no. What do you got to say about that, frog face? Huh? Wow, Argent is doing frog face? He's about to get canceled. <laughs> Hey, I forgot about their tongues. Lasers. Oh, there's the Vredel's ship. Looks like a different kind than their last one, but I, I like this one more. And a goofy reference too. Man, they're just really testing me right now, aren't they? Those are cool breaks. Surrender your weapons, or we shall be obliged to use this. <laughs> See, I feel like what's happening is supposed to be a bigger deal than it feels. Like, so much of this episode is just using humor to try to subvert the seriousness of the situation, but we're not getting the seriousness in the first place. They're doing the subversion without the groundwork. So it's like, how am I supposed to actually feel anything or care about what's going on? And it's just jokes upon jokes upon jokes upon jokes upon jokes. And like, sure, you could argue maybe that's the point, but as you'll later see, no, like this shit is pretty real. What's happening right now? what all of this means, this is a huge deal. The universe is literally about to be destroyed forever. But like, they're so focused on playing towards these characters' tropes, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that's genuinely giving a shit about what's happening right now, other than maybe being mildly entertained by some of the characters here. But like, come on, you, you gotta take this a little bit more seriously if you're actually going to destroy the universe right now. Gotta be a own button somewhere. It's far less impressive in person. Oh, he said it's, Never mind. he's still doing contractions. Put that thing down before it goes off. Ben. I got this. Even the music is kind of like not really hitting the beats it should. And maybe it sounds like I'm being too critical, but as I always say, I'm only critical about things that the show has proven it can do better previously. And Omniverse has been amazing with music so far, so I know that they could do better than this. And Len Uli, the writer of this episode, has given us emotional beats like in Peer Pressure, Double or Nothing, A Night to Remember. He's got those stories under his belt. And now we're about to have the whole universe blown up and every angle of the episode is treating it like a goddamn joke in a world where we have seen the show treat something like that like it matters so you can't even say like that's not the nature of ben 10 because it is it is the nature of ben 10 they do take this kind of stuff seriously so when they don't it's like what I, I can't take it anymore wow these characters are very zoomed in look at the outline thickness between arjun and these guns I, I can't take it anymore me neither buddy just just go ahead and kill everybody <laughs> So nobody even pressed this button, it just opened up and started activating, so I wonder what actually turns this thing on. There is no safe distance is going to destroy the universe! I mean, if Arjit cared so much, why would he risk selling it to Milius? I get he's not the brightest tool in the crayon box, but Arjit's not an idiot, he's just sleazy. That's his whole thing, is backstabbing people. There's a very big difference between writing a character who's annoying and writing a character who's stupid, and Omniverse is kind of mix and matching them as if they're the same thing. As much as I don't like Arjit, I at least understand like he's smarter than this. Why are you all standing around? Somebody has to stop! 
is moving around with like Sonic the Hedgehog sound effects. I don't want goop. I don't want stink fly. Those are the same aliens that Ben said he didn't want back in Inspector 13. You might get something worse. Goop or stink fly. So I guess he really devalues their usefulness in dire situations. Just give me something I can use to defuse this thing. Hey, the hologram. It's very quick, but it counts. Alien X gets an Omniverse transformation sequence. And it's funny because this is pretty much how he looks like in UAF. And then he turns and then boom, here comes the massive chin. I know the chin is very divisive among fans. So what do y'all think? How do you how do you like about Alien X's big, overly muscular and heroic physique in Omniverse? Let me know in the comments down below. Alien X, it is real. I like how he says it and not he's. And great sound design too. Here it goes. Goodbye, universe. And this is the last time we'll ever see these characters genuinely ever again. This is it. There goes their whole Earth, too. Now there's nothing but Alien X floating in this empty, universeless void. Ben Tennyson has come to visit us again. After previously being voiced by both Vicki Lewis and Tara Strong, Serena has her third voice actress now with Kimberly Brooks. Tell me when he leaves. Bellicus, after being voiced by Kevin Conroy and Jeff Bennett, is now voiced by Eric Bowser. The universe really is being destroyed? So it takes until now for Ben to finally understand that the Annihilarg is real and so are all of the legends. You gotta be kidding me, man. Must they make so much noise. That's one part that also bothers me. There's their chance to really address the dire consequences of what's happening. Ben turns around and you literally hear the screams of everybody being vaporized. And you get like barely a second of a reaction shot from Ben. And then Bellicus just mocking them. Although I do feel like it's very much in Bellicus's character to say something like, Oh, they should just be quiet. You know, these mortals dying. They had it coming and whatnot. Must they make so much noise. Sure, but it's like this episode has already been undercutting everything left and right. You, you gotta give me something here. If anything, at least if I can change one small nitpick, let Ben's reaction to the world being destroyed just last a little bit longer and lean more into this. This is the moment where they can make it seem like they care at least a little bit about what they're doing here. And it goes like, and that's it. And with the effects they use on the screaming, it's kind of hard to even tell it screams as well. I, I wonder if it's a censorship issue. Like if they're not allowed to show how brutal this really is, but then again, why even do it in the first place? But I feel like that can't be true either because the show's gotten away with a lot more direct confirmation and addressing stories about death, emotional trauma, this and that. It, it's starting to sound like I'm one of those people where I'm just like, oh, I want my characters to suffer and feel pain. And it's just like, no, but if you're going to make these scenarios happen, happen like they're writing these episodes not me and you're doing it in a show where they have treated things like this seriously before and this is one of the biggest deals ever and they're just kind of like eh it's all a joke it really does just feel like a bad choice like this is not good writing i'm sorry i really think it is chalked up to them being afraid to push things that serious anymore because omniverse is supposed to be the reset series the one that's supposed to be lighter and funner and goofier and made for a younger audience again and try to reel back in a new generation of fans where they're just like we can't go this heavy like we used to anymore and i feel like thinking about it like that is the only way where i can accept that decision but knowing the capability and the talent talent of these writers and them choosing to just constantly underplay the whole universe getting destroyed which is a permanent thing by the way they don't even reset everything or undo it or bring everybody back to life like this is it they're gone they create an exact duplicate i don't know man i can ramble on about this forever this is just this is not the way to do it you gotta let me use alien x to stop the annihil arg oh it's too late for me now, that is one thing I've been waiting to comment on about, too. I don't think Bellicus means, like, it's genuinely too late to save them, as in they're incapable of doing so. Because for one, Bellicus and Serena can just be flat out wrong. Bellicus also told Ben that he'd be trapped as Alien X forever. Alien X doesn't do anything until it's put to a vote. Now we finally found a tiebreaker. How could we ever let you go? You're never changing back. And then it turns out that wasn't true and Ben can transform back. And they're also constantly deliberating about what is right and what they should be doing doing with their powers. I see this as Bellicus just refusing to help out Ben in this regard and saying, oh, it's too late because it's not. They really could fix it if they wanted to. In fact, the Chrono Sapien Time Bomb, which absolutely outranks the Annihilarg because it destroys infinite
infinite universes rather than just one, and that can be undone by a Chrono Sapien, a being that is much lower than a Celestial Sapien. All of the logic in the show itself, not even just using theories to fill in the blanks, like the show itself confirms that you can bring back a dead universe. And it also confirms that sometimes Belkis and Serena just don't want to do something. So I fully believe that they could save the universe if they want to. And they're just kind of like, eh, screw you, Ben. That's the universe! It's everything there is! Okay, I'm, I'm appreciating the defense of saving the universe. Alien X can do many things. We just both have to agree to it. See, here they didn't even straight up say no. I love this sequence, though. This part is amazing. Everything about it, visually and the music. Like, this is the kind of tone that you need to apply for a story like this. There's that reused electrical sequence again from Fighting the Dagon and Shock Squatch and all that. I love this part too, how the stars fly off of him and become new galaxies while the Omniverse theme plays dramatically. This, this scene saves it a little bit for me. And I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but the way the floor ripples reminds me a little bit of the time circle that he made in his first appearance. You see the earth get rebuilt and everything and all the stars blink back into the sky. But there are, in fact, some differences. You can look in the back and get a glimpse at the new Mr. Smoothie, and now Ben is wearing a hoodie, so... Very passive ways of saying things aren't exactly the way they used to be, now that the universe has been remade. Also looks like Mr. Riedel here is on top of Arjit. I think Arjit should be on the layer in front of him. Whoa. No boom? But now everything has been reset to the point where right before the Annihilarg was destroyed. Although right before it explodes, you see this electric aura fire out of his hands. And they do see Ben as Alien X. They even react to that. This is all before it explodes. So I was gonna do a quick edit where, like, you'd see things from their perspective. And it would sort of be like... Whoa. But even that doesn't really work because they're all in different positions and they wouldn't have seen Ben become Alien X. And Milius is still holding the Annihil Arc, whereas here it's on the ground. So even in a matter of sequence of events, this universe isn't exactly picking up from what happened beforehand. It's like the universe was remade like a minute or two before all of the Alien X stuff with some changes as well. It's a dud. And of course, it's fragile enough to just be smushed by a foot. That is difficult to believe. I was too late to save the universe, so I used Alien X to make a whole new one. And everyone's so casual about it, too. Again, like, I'm not so focused on this needs to be tragic and depressing and all of that stuff, but there's gotta be some type of reaction to this, right? Like, some acknowledgement about the true repercussions of what all of this means. Like, this isn't even Rook and Arjit anymore. This isn't even Mr. Smoothie. Everything is an exact duplicate. The authentic versions of everyone and everything we know is gone forever. And the only sole survivor of the previous universe just does not seem to care or be phased. And if Ben can show remorse for like the loss of Laura Lynn, or Saul in the Ultimates, or when they thought the Andromeda 5 was dead, or when Gwen allegedly died, this is all of that combined multiplied by a trillion. And Ben's just sitting here slurping smoothies, not a care in the world. Like you'd have to jump through in an immense amount of hoops to justify that Ben would genuinely just sit here and not care. Or imply things that aren't actually in the episode like maybe ben does care but he's repressing the trauma or this and that or he hasn't fully processed his emotions on the subject that's not really true either because as seasons upon seasons go on later and we get to universe v tennyson the episode that addresses these events he still does not care do you think it would escape our notice when we create the entire universe told you the only thing he cares about is the damn smoothie flavor but i just couldn't get the grape flavor right <laughs> like you gotta be fucking with me right now are you serious like this is pretty much the show telling me that like we could do anything and just don't care don't worry about it it's fine do not emotionally invest yourself into any of these characters or anything that happens because we certainly won't so why should you i made an exact copy in the universe including you don't believe me i don't care i saved the universe again that's all that matters. Man, Omniverse really makes it so hard to defend sometimes. Like, sure, gushing about the art's easy. But when it comes to the writing and the stories and it's doing stuff like this, I'm sorry, sometimes it's just as, if not even stupider than UAF. It just, it is. Doesn't taste the same. 
All right, well, I mean, if the show's not gonna care enough to analyze this with any type of meaning, why should I? Plots of two, not just with my own frustrations from it, but it really is like an empty feeling episode. It's one of those episodes where it's written with basic beats in mind and all of the scenes are just trying to get them from one section to another. You can tell there's a lot of scenes that they're just throwing in here because they don't really know what else to do to eat up the time. If for some reason you're watching this breakdown without seeing the episode proper, just go watch it and you'll see what I mean. The pacing drags on in all the worst ways and the one thing they should be focusing on they breeze right through. This whole episode was basically just an excuse to canonically reset the universe and bring back a bunch of other characters that like some people like but they're all very very divisive characters. They're like what if we just took every character that the fan base is very split on and put them all together in one of the most important episodes that creates such a frustrating dynamic that's made for such a specific flavor of humor and a specific type of audience that not even the the general amount of Ben 10 fans. Like if you've been around long enough, you see how people react to these type of characters. It's just this whole episode is stitched together by their obnoxious gimmicks. And I am firmly confident I'm not the only one that feels this way. Like outside of the fact the Annihilarg exists and the fact that the universe resets, which collectively all those things maybe make up about two minutes of the total runtime. What was this episode? Leads me to characterization, which I'll be generous enough to give a two. I'm not really ranking the characters on who they are. Most of the characters here are just walking gimmicks. And you know, they're technically in character because they hone in on those gimmicks. But when it comes to personality, there's nothing there, really. They are the jokes that they speak and nothing else. And even Ben himself, he's been reduced to the whole Niall arc joke, and he's emotionally distant from any of the repercussions of what he's done. Which, if you've been following these breakdowns for the past 150-ish episodes, you know how out of character that is for him. It's ridiculous. Like, you, you, you really can't even defend it. You have to apply outside unintended logic for it to make sense. Even then, it's all confirmed in dozens upon dozens episodes later, the universe v Tennyson, that Ben still does not care that this happened. It's ridiculous. And even Rook himself, who's been a joy to watch in Omniverse, he's kind of just eh in this episode. There's like, no one really to care about in this episode, and the characters themselves don't care. Visuals is not bad. It has two really fantastic sequences, the Crash Hopper sequence, and of course Alien X recreating the universe, but other than that, it's just kind of Omniverse being Omniverse. You know, now that we're starting to get used to the art style and used to the animation, I can't keep praising it as if it's fresh in a brand new take every single time. Like, after a while, all this fantastic smoke and explosion animations and lasers and lighting, it, it becomes standard. So it relies on what the show does with it in order to embrace those traits and strengths that it has. And it didn't really do much with it this episode. Importance is a five, self-explanatory. And entertaining, it's a three. It's not boring. Well, at least it is to me, but I can see how some folks might find enjoyment from this. And the concept of Ben failing to save the universe and creating a duplicate is pretty interesting, but this feels like Omniverse is already coasting through. But I mean, with three solid episodes, the two-part pilot and a jolt from the past, this being episode four now, it's done enough to rope you into the show where it can dial it back a bit. But still a pretty good score, but hasn't quite lived up to the hype that it's set itself so far. So just a quick little note, the Incursion ships, they're their anchors are little holographic tongue things. I just think that's neat. I wish I pointed that down in the breakdown. I also want to go over last week's poll. After the first wave of returning villains, it seems like Siphon takes the lead as everyone's favorite. And yeah, he's the coolest one out of the bunch. I did appreciate that they did start off strong with bringing back recurring characters from the other series, but out of the familiar bunch, Siphon's definitely the one that benefited most from Omniverse. For this week's poll, I wanted to ask y'all, do you think the Celestial Sapiens being an in-canon reason for all the changes in the Ben 10 franchise franchise is a good idea. So let me know what y'all think in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy.